Welcome to Luxoft Tech Talks, a series of podcasts in which IT gurus share their knowledge and discuss the latest trends and innovations in the world of IT. We are going to cover the most recent developments in the programming languages, frameworks, and technologies that are shaping the future of the software industry. This new format of online learning is part of Luxoft Learning Management and Development Services rebranding. Please share your feedback in the comments to let us know what speakers and topics you would like us to cover in later installments. Hello everyone, and welcome to this talk from Luxoft Tech Series on latest JDK security enhancements. Um, just before we start, a few short words about me. My name is Martin. I'm currently working uh, as an architect for a company called Resolve Systems, and also I'm doing some side consultancy as part of my own company called Coffee Cup Consulting. I'm also one of the guys who helps run the events of the Bulgarian Java user group, where we also have our own community conference called J Prime. I'm also a very big open JDK and Oracle database enthusiast, and you can reach me out uh, on Twitter and ask me for anything related to this. So uh, what we are going to cover today at this talk, first we are going to see what are the latest enhancements to the original security sandbox model in the JDK. And apart from that, we are going to look into some of the coolest enhancements that have been added in regards to security in latest JDK releases, uh, starting from, from release nine and up to the latest JDK. So this means we're going to talk about the TLS support enhancements introduced in the JDK, uh, the DTLS protocol support introduced in JDK 9. Also, we are going to cover the TLS ALPN extension, which is quite an interesting extension added as well uh, to the TLS portfolio of the JDK. And also we are going to cover briefly the rest of the security enhancements. Okay, let's start. So first, uh, let's see what are the enhancements to the original security sandbox model in JDK. As many of you know, uh, Java 9 introduced a new module system uh, with the main idea of uh, modularizing the big monolithic JDK code base. And also the JDK 9 module system allows developers to, to have an additional type of packaging in terms of Java 9 modules. And this type of packaging, in fact, introduces another layer of security. Um, however, with the introduction of this additional type of packaging, there is, in fact, no significant change to the original security sandbox model. Uh, however, one thing that has changed is the introduction of a new way to specify security permissions for Java runtime modules. Uh, you can use the special GRP uh, protocol prefix in your security policy file, for example, and specify a runtime module that if you've installed in your JDK. And inside that block, you can specify permissions in the regular manner that you can do over JAR files or Java class files. That's the major point here. So the security sandbox model, in fact, remains unchanged. However, now you can specify permissions for your uh, runtime modules that you've installed in the JDK. In terms of uh, TLS support uh, in the JDK, so originally the JDK has been supporting uh, the different versions of the TLS series of specifications. Before JDK 9, uh, the JDK provides support for TLS 1.0, 1.1, and 1.2 through the JSCC API or Java Secure Socket Extensions API. And support for the latest TLS 1.3 version of the specification uh, is provided as part of JDK 11. In fact, TLS 1.3 introduces a number of enhancements such as uh, various performance improvements around the TLS handshake, uh, stronger support for stronger cryptographic uh, algorithms, and so on. And TLS, as most of you know, is typically used to secure most types of application protocols. Another interesting application of TLS is the implementation of SSL VPNs. And this is an overview of how the general TLS handshake um, mechanism works. In fact, before we can start exchanging secure messages between the client and the server, we need to be able to establish the TLS handshake. So first the client sends a hello message to the, to the TLS server. 
and it provides the TLS version and the cryptographic shippers that the plan supports. The server, on its behalf, responds with the server hello message, and the server provides the server public certificate, the TLS version, and the cryptographic shipper that it negotiates with the client. The client may verify the server's public certificates and cryptographic parameters, and for that purpose, the client may use uh, a list of certificate authorities and a particular mechanism to verify the public certificate supplied by the server. Optionally, the client may also send its own public certificate to the server, and the client also sends the secret key uh, used for the secure communication between the client and the server. At that point, uh, additional messages are exchanged to uh, notify the client and the server that the handshake process has finished, and then we can start exchanging secure messages. Now, as we mentioned, uh, the TLS implementation of the JDK uh, is a part of the uh, Java Secure Socket Extension API, and there is a default uh, provider uh, for the JSCC API, which is called Sun Java Secure Socket Extension. The core classes are part of the Java XNet and Java XNet SSL packages. And there are two modes of operation. There is a blocking mode of operation, which is the more popular one, and a non-blocking mode of operation, which is more complex, uh, but provides an asynchronous way of communication, secure communication between the client and the server. And there is also the HTTP SURL connection class uh, which is used to simplify TLS communication between HTTP endpoints. The blocking mode of operation of the Java Secure Socket extension is provided by the SSL socket class. Uh, and in fact, if you've already, if you're already familiar with how to write uh, communication between regular client server sockets, you would uh, have no uh, issues getting started using SSL sockets. Uh, when you use SSL sockets, the actual TLS handshake mechanism can be triggered uh, by using several different mechanisms. The first one is if you explicitly call the start handshake method on the SSL socket instance, or if you want to get the SSL session from the uh, SSL socket and there is already no uh, TLS handshake process that has been triggered, or if you try to read or write to the SSL socket and again, there is no handshake process uh, that takes place. And if you want to use the JCC blocking mode of operation, uh, this is an example of how you, you can create a very simple TLS uh, server um, in JCC. So first, you, we set two properties to specify the location of the key store uh, that stores the public certificates of the TLS server and the password for our key store. Then we get an SSL server socket factory to create the actual uh, SSL server socket. Then we create the SSL server socket on port 4444. And if we want to use TLS 1.3, which as I mentioned earlier is introduced in JDK 11, you can call the set enable protocols method and pass the uh, string that specifies the TLS 1.3 version of the protocol. Uh, which in latest versions of the JDK is the default one, by the way. And also you can specify the cryptographic shippers uh, that are to be used along with TLS 1.3. Uh, then uh, you call the accept method to receive connection from the SSL client. Then you read the input and you, uh, you also send some output back to the client. And finally you close the the socket and the related uh, input output streams. And this is how an SSL client might look like. Um, in using two properties, you set the trust store and trust store password. Um, the trust store um, allows the client to specify uh, the uh, certificate authorities it uses for uh, public certificate um, validation from, of the certificate that's provided by a TLS server. Then we again uh, use an SSL socket factory instance to create the client SSL socket. We create the client SSL socket on port 4444. And again, we specify that the client will be using TLS 1.3 with a corresponding cryptographic shipper. Then we create a print writer to print something to the SSL server. 
and write back the response received from the server. So that's a very basic um, TLS client implementation uh, in JDK. If you want to use the non-blocking mode of operation, um, you can uh, use the SSL engine class, which provides two methods for writing and reading data from, um, from the network. The wrap and unwrap methods are in fact used to transfer data. And the way it works is that first, uh, the application writes data to so-called application by buffers uh, using the wrap method that, that data is in fact sent from the application by buffers over to the network by buffers from where it uh, starts uh, the transfer over the network. And if you want to read some data, you call the unwrap method that reads the information from the network by buffers and writes it to the application by buffers uh, that, is, that are available to the application for processing. And again, the TLS uh, handshake process in the non-blocking mode of operation can be triggered in pretty much the same way as with the blocking mode. You can either call the begin handshake method or you can call the wrap and unwrap methods. And if no handshake has taken place, it is triggered behind the scenes. As I said, the SSL non-blocking mode of operation is way more complex to use in the SSL socket API. Uh, can be used along with uh, another API provided um, called Socket Channel API. And if you want to, uh, in fact, provide information on um, uh, how is the TLS handshake process established or how are secure messages exchanged uh, in, in TLS communication, you can, provide, you can use the Java XNet debug system property. Uh, by specifying um, specific settings. For example, if you specify the all setting, it will print information about both the handshake uh, messages that are exchanged and the actual um, SSL messages being exchanged between the client and the server. And you can also fine tune this setting by specifying either only SSL or handshake as a value. Now let's talk a bit about uh, the DTLS protocol um, that's supported as of JDK 9. So TLS uh, originally runs on top of a reliable transport protocol such as TCP. However, many applications such as DNS or SIP um, really need to use unreliable connection. And in, that, in those cases, we need to have a protocol uh, equivalent of TLS that also works on top of UDP. And that's the purpose of the TLS, to be in fact TLS running on top of UDP. And the DTLS protocol specifications in fact follow the TLS specifications. At present there is version 1.3 uh, in development, which is also supported by the JDK. Uh, if we want to compare DTLS with TLS in, with some more details, uh, in DTLS, there is uh, an explicit sequence number field edit, which is used for reordering purposes uh, by the JDK uh, specifically. Uh, in DTLS, there is also some drop support for uh, certain cryptographic shippers, uh, such as RC4. There is also edit retransmission timer for uh, resending of packets uh, in case of failed packets. Also, there is a MAC verification failure that triggers warning instead of failure in DTLS. And there is a new hello verify request message used in order to identify uh, the sender. So if you want to use DTLS in fact before JDK9, you have a few options such as, for example, use a third party um, provider such as the Bouncy Castle Java Secure Socket Extension or plugging directly with an external library such as OpenSSL using JNI. Uh, the JDK uh, provides support for TLS 1.0 and 1.2 as of JDK 9. And the implementation is in fact adapted to the Java Secure Socket Extension API. Uh, the SSL engine API can typically be used along with the Datagram Socket API if you want to use uh, DTLS. And the implementation of DTLS, in fact, is based on the SSL engine API, which, as we mentioned, is the non-blocking mode of operation. 
which uh, makes use of DTLS at present uh, hard to use directly from the JDK. There are certain things that are taken into account in the implementation of DTLS, such as, for example, um, order delivery is automatically provided by the SSL engine class. It's not mandatory for the DCLS protocol itself. However, JDK implementation provides this order delivery out of the box. Also, you can retrieve the current sequence number uh, from the message that you receive from the SSL engine using the sequence number methods. And if you have some messages that have failed uh, to be transmitted between the client and the server, you need to make sure in your application uh, logic that they are retransmitted properly. However, for the purpose of the DTLS handshake process, messages uh, must be delivered properly. And for that reason, behind the scenes, uh, the JDK makes sure that the delivery of failed messages uh, is, is established in the case of the DTLS handshake. Uh, to get started with DTLS, you create uh, an instance of the SSL context for DTLS. You specify some initialization parameters. Then you create an SSL engine instance out of that SSL context. You specify whether you want to use the client or the server mode of operation. And then you can start using um, the SSL engine to establish the communication between the client and the server using the wrap and unwrap method. And there are some, some good examples of how to use DTLS, which are provided by the JDK9 test suite, uh, which is publicly available. Another interesting extension around TLS is the ALPN or the Application Layer Protocol Negotiation Extension, which is uh, also edited in JDK9. And the extension is used to identify the application protocol during the TLS handshake process. This means that using this extension, the client and the server can be used, in fact, to negotiate what would be the exact application protocol to use for the communication. And the LPN extension does not require additional round trips uh, in terms of additional TLS handshake messages. The client hello message is used for the purpose. And uh, in addition to that, it allows the server to send also different public certificates based on the different application protocols being negotiated between the client and the server. And a typical use case for that is if you have, for example, a server that supports both, for example, HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2 version of the protocol. However, different clients support different versions of um, the HTTP protocol. In that case, uh, when those clients establish um, TLS uh, communication with the server, they can use any of the HTTP versions that they support. And ALPN comes um, to rescue in that case. Uh, well, before handshake process is triggered uh, from the corresponding uh, SSL socket or SSL engine instance, uh, you need to be, uh, you need to specify the application protocols that are supported for both the client and the server. And you can do that by calling the set application protocols methods on the SSL parameter instance that uh, specifies parameters for either the SSL software SSL engine instance being used. Then when you specify the supported application protocols, you trigger the handshake process either explicitly by calling any of the appropriate methods or uh, behind the scenes if you try to read or write data uh, to the socket or uh, to the SSL engine instance. And then once the communication is established, you can uh, get uh, what is the exact application protocol being negotiated from the SSL socket or SSL engine instance by calling the get application protocol methods. You can also specify a more complex logic to, to resolve the actual protocol being negotiated. Uh, the previous methods that we saw, the set application protocol methods, they were just passing a list of um, uh, protocol names and strings. And in that particular case, if you want to provide more complex logic for the protocol resolution, you can call the set handshake application protocol selector method and pass a lambda that um, has two parameters, the server socket and the client protocols that are supplied by the client. In that particular example, we get uh, an instance of the SSL session 
created currently during the TLS handshake. Then we get uh, from that session the cryptographic shipper um, and also the packet buffer size uh, for the particular um, uh, server. And we compare if the cryptographic shipper is RC4 and the packet buffer size is larger than um, 1024 bytes, then we return protocol one. Uh, otherwise, we return protocol two. And as you can see, this is a way more complex manner to establish the application protocol during the TLS handshake process. Now let's see some demo on some of the things that we've already uh, discussed. Uh, what we'll be discussing before the demo is a very simple banking application that supports a variety of protocols. So each banking application can use one or more uh, protocols that are supported by the banking server and using those protocols, it can send data to a variety of applications uh, integrated with that banking server application. So before we uh, see some of the examples, we are going to look into how our banking server application works. I'm just going to increase the font a bit so you can see my screen better. So uh, I have a very uh, simple banking server, which is provided by the banking server class. And in fact, my bank banking server makes use of the service loader utility to load the various applications that implement the banking application uh, interface, which is very simple. It provides just a single execute method. And for all of those applications that are retrieved uh, by the banking server that are currently deployed, I call the execute methods. All the protocol implementations must implement another interface, which is called banking protocol. And each protocol has a particular name and also an execute method, which identifies how can we execute a particular packet, which is a stream of bytes using that particular protocol. Also for uh, the actual execution of the um, packets for the, against the protocols, we have a protocol service uh, which, in short, what it does, it iterates over all the protocols and checks what is the protocol implementation that handles the particular protocol identified by the name. And when it gets that implementation, it calls the protocol execute methods on the particular protocol implementation. And to demonstrate how it works, we have a, a demo application that's deployed as part of the banking uh, server. This demo application implements the banking application interface. Uh, it creates a very simple packet. Uh, details are omitted because they are not important for that particular case. Then we create an instance of the protocol service supplied by the banking server and call the send packet method by passing the fixed protocol implementation. The fixed protocol implementation is provided by a separate project. If you look into how does it look like, we have a fixed protocol class which implements the banking protocol interface and the protocol has a name of fix and the execute method we just print out uh, that we're going to send fixed protocol packets. Uh, all of these projects are organized as uh, Java 9 modules. We're not going to cover the details here. I've already pre-built those projects. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to uh, recompile my uh, demo application. And since it uses the fixed protocol, I'm going to trigger that demo application uh, from its corresponding module. So I'm going to start the banking server and I can see that it detects the demo application and it uses the fixed protocol uh, to send the fixed protocol packet. Now let's see how, for example, we can get started using um, the LPN extension. For that purpose, I have a very simple LPN server uh, that uh, where I use my own uh, key store uh, with some key store passwords. And here in the um, ALPN server, I've specified that the application protocols that I support are XMPP 1.1 and XMPP 1.2. And I create the SSL server socket and I start it. So I'm going to run the um, SSL server with the LPN extension enabled. 
And then I'm going to provide uh, an, another implementation of my banking protocol, which corresponds to the XMPP protocol. In that implementation, uh, I'm specifying that uh, my protocol implementation supports XMPP 1.1. And in fact, it creates an SSL server socket, uh, a client socket that connects to the SSL server that I just started. Now, if I want to use that protocol implementation as part of my demo application, I need to go back to my uh, demo application and change the protocol to XMPP, which matches the name of the protocol implementation I've just showed you. Now I'm going to recompile again my demo application and run it. And I'm going to see that the negotiated version of the protocol is XMPP 1.1. This is the version that matches the one specified in both the clan and the server. If there are more than one matching version available on both the clan and the server, the first one that matches is going to be the one that's negotiated uh, by the TLS clan and server. And now if we want to uh, get started with DTLS, I have a um, DTLS server, which I'm going to start. Uh, so the DTLS server uh, has quite some logic, which in fact is specific to the uh, SSL handshake process. And uh, all of this information, in fact, is taken from unit tests available for DTLS. Uh, then this might be quite error prone if you try to achieve everything uh, on your own. So you can take that logic as granted from the unit tests. And what I'm going to show you here and the specific thing is uh, how can we in fact uh, get an instance of the SSL engine class. So in our application, uh, we establish again the key store and the trust store uh, on the local instance for the DTLS server. Uh, here we create an SSL engine for the purpose. And in the SSL engine instance, uh, here the essential thing is that we create an SSL context for DTLS. We, uh, we don't specify any key and trust store to initialize it with. And then we create an SSL engine out of that context. Uh, and we also do some additional things such as uh, receiving and sending data uh, from the client. We are not going to cover the, the details here. Now, to interact with that DTLS server, we need to have a DTLS client. And that DTLS client is provided by the SIP protocol implementation. So let's assume we have a chat application, which is served by the DTLS server that we just started. And we also need to have a chat client, which is provided by the SIP protocol implementation. The protocol name is SIP. And here again, I also have a lot of logic really specific to the handshake process that needs to be established. But the essential thing here is that I create an SSL context in pretty much the same way as with the uh, SSL TLS server. I call the init method again by not passing any key or trust store. Um, again, and then I create an SSL engine instance and I specify that the client mode here, um, that I'm going to use a client mode of operation. Now, going back to my demo application, I'm going to specify that I'm going to use the C protocol. And now I need to be to rebuild again my, uh, to recompile my demo application and run it. And when I run it, uh, I'm sending uh, a C protocol packet to the server. In that particular case, I don't see any message flowing. I'm just going to stop the server. I'm going to start it again. And boom, uh, when I start it, I see that the server receives the message, but it tells me that I don't have any common cryptographic shifters between the client and the server. And the reason for that is because I haven't specified a matching set of cryptographic shifters. So in that manner, we, we were able to demonstrate some of the core concepts introduced uh, in the latest JDK security enhancements. Now, looking into some of the other security enhancements um, that have been introduced, we also have OCSP stopping for TCP. 
So OCSP stapling um, is in fact a technique that allows us to reduce uh, the number of requests that we make uh, against the certificate authority to, to verify that the public certificate uh, provided by the TLS server is valid. And the way this is done is uh, in fact that the TLS server performs the certificate validation rather than the TLS client. And it, in that regard, the TLS server is also able to cache the OCSP responses uh, returned from the certificate authority, thus minimizing the number of requests in it, it, it needs to send. In order to use OCSP stapling, you need to enable it on both the TLS client and server, uh, specifying uh, particular settings. For the server, you need to specify JDK TLS server enable status request extension equals true. And for the client, you need to specify two settings as the JDK TLS client enable status request extension true and Comson net SSL check revocation true. Another uh, interesting uh, enhancement is the introduction of the PKCS12 key stores. Um, uh, they in fact replace the Java key store format as the default key store format. The benefit of this is that Java key store format is in fact a proprietary format which is specific for the JDK, while PKCS12 is a more general purpose specification that defines the layout of the key stores. And in that regard, uh, key stores by default are more interoperable. Uh, you can share uh, key store information with uh, other application, non-Java non applications. Also, the PKCS12 specification provides support for stronger cryptographic algorithms uh, and other additional enhancements. Other security enhancements include, uh, for example, the uh, um, a new secure random uh, series of implementations. Uh, also, uh, additional CPU instructions for the GHash and RSA algorithms are leveraged, which allow for um, faster uh, execution of those algorithms based on those instructions. Also, SHA-1 certificates are disabled for certificate uh, validation. And there is a new implementation of the SHA-3 uh, hash algorithms also provided in JDK. As of JDK 10, there is already a default set of root certificates exposed in the CA search trust store file, which lists um, trusted certificate authorities that are part of the uh, Oracle partner network. Also, we have uh, implementation of the ChaCha 20 and Poly 1305 cryptographic algorithms uh, as of JDK 11 and new elliptic curve key agreements algorithms, uh, which are also part of JDK 11. And another thing is that there are some security APIs uh, either deprecated uh, or you know, removed entirely. And there is a very nice tweet uh, by Sean Lan, which lists, in fact, uh, what is the exact version that deprecates the particular set of classic methods or, or packages and uh, whether in which version are they targeted for removal. So for example, there are some uh, APIs from the Java Security Manager which are deprecated and removed as of JDK 10. There are some packages such as Java Security ACL uh, and some classes from the uh, related to uh, public certificates which are also uh, removed. Uh, and the list continues with some additional um, methods from, for example, GSS context that are also removed uh, and methods from other security APIs. And as a summary, uh, we can see that there is a significant um, set of security features and enhancements introduced in the latest versions of the JDK. The majority of them is in fact related to the TLS support uh, provided by the JDK. One of the major things being the introduction of TLS 1.3 as part of JDK 11. And hopefully we're going to see this tendency of introducing more and more enhancements and features in the security portfolio of the JDK continuing, especially in terms of stronger cryptographic algorithms, uh, more security utilities, and so on.
Also, thank you for the attention.